All right, kiddos, head for the hills. Adults, where are we going? Luke 9. Gosh, y'all are on to this. I looked it up. It's been 27 weeks. You should be on to it by now. Luke 9, Luke 9. Again, you, you don't even need to turn there, all right? You don't even need to turn there. If you don't know what we're talking about, then welcome to, to Cross Point. It's good to have you back or good to have you in the house. Luke 9, what does it say? And Jesus does what? Set his face. How? Strongly, resolutely, determinedly, right? Somebody saw it and somebody told Luke there was a moment. I'll never forget this moment. We were just doing our thing. He was kind of doing the teaching thing. And then all of a sudden, his face, it was different. And we started making our way towards Jerusalem. Now, why was he going to Jerusalem? To die. Why? Why? For us, because I desperately needed that atoning work. Because God proved his love for me by doing what? By dying on that cross. He didn't just say, I love you. He didn't just feel good about us. He proved his love for us. And so when you start to think about this, you, it's, you, you're not responding to an emotion. You're responding to the mercies of God. Not the mercy of God. Everybody with me on that? We, we, we confuse that in Romans 12. Well, Paul isn't saying, I urge you because God is merciful that you should do all this. No, he says, I urge you because God has been merciful. His mercies are why I'm imploring you to make your life a living sacrifice. So when he sets his face towards Jerusalem, he set that for you and for me because he was proving his love, not just talking about it. He was proving it for us, all right? So let's go on over here to Luke 18. We're going to pick up a story, a very familiar story to you. Uh, it's referred to often as the rich, young ruler, all right, uh, which is an interesting sort of combination of texts. So we have Luke isn't out on his own anymore, all right? We're kind of merging back with Matthew and Mark at this point in the story. So everything we've done for the last 20-something weeks has been what we call Luke's interpolation or Luke he's telling. And we understand this from Luke's prologue is Luke says, I've interviewed the eyewitnesses, and I'm giving you, Theophilus, some figure out there, an orderly account. And so he's just relating these stories. So what we've done for the last 20-something weeks was Luke's kind of, I, I have this story that Matthew and Mark didn't really include, and John hadn't written his yet, all right? And so what we find is Matthew and Mark coming back together with Luke at this point with the rich young ruler, all right? Um, we're going to pick up one more of Luke-only story when we get to Zacchaeus, all right? So give me a couple of weeks, and we'll get to that one, all right? But we find here in Luke 18, we get this guy, the rich young ruler, okay? Now, Luke tells us that he is a ruler, and he also tells us that he is wealthy, that he is rich, all right? So we rich are ruler, and we get rich, but we don't get young in Luke's version, Mark only tells us that he is rich. He doesn't say he's a ruler, and he doesn't say he is young. He's just a guy, all right? Matthew is the one that includes that he is a young man, all right, and that he is wealthy, okay? Does everybody understand that? So we kind of jam them all together, but you got to be careful with that because I think Luke's trying to make a certain point when he just refers to him as a ruler. And I think Matthew is trying to make a point when he says that he was a young man, all right? Because they leave out different aspects of this story. Mark kind of just does it because that's Peter, all right? I always say this. When you read Mark, you need to understand you're hearing the experience of Peter. And Peter was in Rome with Mark. We believe that Peter was dictating the story to Mark, and Mark was simply writing it down. And at the end of it, he wrote, the end, love, Mark. And so we went, let's call it the Gospel of Mark, all right? But understand, and it's so clear, we see this so many times, and we'll talk about it today, that it's Peter's version, all right? So imagine Peter writing a gospel, all right? It's going to be action-oriented. It's going to be a lot of just movement. It's going to be quick, all right? That's why I always don't tell new believers to read John. Can I just tell you all that? I know that's what's been told to do, for us to do that forever. <laughs> okay, 25 years of pastoring, three years of seminary, I still get confused with John. Okay, don't send a new believer there. Send them to Mark, all right? Because Mark is Peter, and Peter has a simple version. Everybody with me? Okay, so in Luke 18, we pick up the beginning of the story, and here's what I want you to think about as we discuss this, all right? Who is this guy? 
you probably are going to walk in with some baggage about this guy. You, you're thinking he's rich, he's young, and he's a ruler, and you're, he's going to reject Jesus, and he's going to just kind of back off on this. I was watching John MacArthur. <laughs> always, always laugh. John MacArthur, he, he preaches about joy all the time with a scowl on his face. All right, so if you, if you know who John MacArthur is, you know who I'm talking about. He stands behind this massive wooden thing with this huge church, and he talks about the joy of Christ with this scowl on his face. He's an awesome theologian, but he just has this mean look on his face. It's always just contradictory. And so he's talking about this guy, and he comes across it, and he really sort of indicts this guy. And I kind of want to back off on this, all right, because I know I'm pretty bad myself, all right, and I have my moments. So I don't want to come across as, I don't want you to start the story knowing how the story's going to end and think he's a bad guy. I want you to start the story with a clean slate that Jesus is just about to go on a journey as Mark, as Peter told Mark, right? And this guy comes up. Luke refers to him as a ruler. So look in here in 18, uh, what's it, verse uh, 18? 18, 18. It says, a ruler asked him. Now we don't know what kind of ruler this is. It, all it is, the Greek word archon, which means someone, a, a first person, all right, a, a leading person, all right, it's often translated as prince, all right, so it's someone who has some authority, okay? Mark, through Peter, tells us that as Jesus was going on a journey, someone ran up to him, fell on his knees, and asked Jesus a question, okay? So start to put together sort of a character sketch of this guy. Matthew's version is simply, a man came up and asked a question, okay? So Luke is trying to give us, he's a ruler of some kind, he has some authority, but yet what does he do in the presence of Jesus of Nazareth, who has grand authority, right? What was Jesus' grand lineage? What does he do every time he introduces himself? Hi, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Everybody says what? Nazareth? <laughs> really? All right, I don't know which town that applies to around here, okay? I was born in Gilmer. I don't know if that's one of those you have, oh, Bubba of Gilmer. Really? Gilmer? The yam capital of East Texas, all right? Everybody been to the Yamboree before? That's a real thing, all right? They have little Yamboree kings and queens and princesses and all that stuff, all right? But when they said Jesus of Nazareth, it's like, whoa, who are you? And, and, and what degrees did Jesus have hanging on his wall? What schools did he go to? None. But yet this ruler does what? Runs to him, which is not very dignified for a ruler, okay? Runs to him, falls on his knees, and is asking a question. Now, I don't know who you ask questions of, especially deep theological questions, Generally, I don't pull up to the McDonald's, well, I don't ever pull up to the McDonald's drive-thru, all right? But some drive-thru, I don't ever go to that drive-thru window and go, what must I do to inherit eternal life, person working at the cash register at the drive-in? Why? Because I, I don't think they're, I don't think they've been to seminary. I don't think they have a philosophy degree. There's nothing on the, the thing next to the cash register that says doctorate of philosophy. So who is he asking the question of? He runs, this ruler runs up to Jesus, falls on his knees, so there's urgency and there's humility, and asks a deep, deep, deep theological question. He recognized there's something there. He just doesn't know what it is, all right? So in Luke 18, the ruler asked him, good teacher, and your text says something to the effect of, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, it, that's not a good literal translation. It, it's the better literal translation is what having done will I receive eternal life? So he's not just asking what I need to do from now on, from the future at this point forward. He's saying what have I done in my past leading up till today will achieve or will it cause me to inherit eternal life? So he's thinking, I've been a pretty good kid. That should, I get credit for that, right? He's not asking, now Matthew and Mark have a different translation on this. Matthew and Mark are asking, what might I do so that I might receive eternal life? Okay, it's a, very, a little slight variation, but the implication is, 
I feel like I either need to do something or have done something so that I can get this concept of eternal life, all right? And what's the first question Jesus asks? Or what's the first thing Jesus says in response to this question? He goes on a tangent, doesn't he? What's the tangent? What word does Jesus pick up in, in, in the question? Good, all right? It's the Greek word agathos, all right? It's, think, okay, you, it's Agatha. Anybody know any young Agathas, all right? Amy, you got any Agathas in your class lately? Not in like 40, 50 years? Yeah, okay. So I want you to think Grandma Agatha, all right? Agathas, it's a good thing. Grandma's good. She's sweet. She's kind. She bakes stuff. She's just a wonderful human being. That's kind of Agatha, all right? So we have this other word for good, which is kalos, which is beautiful, excellent, praiseworthy, all right? Do you see how they're pretty much the same thing, but one just has this depth to it, and the other has this consistency to it, all right? And so this is the word. He's saying, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes, why are you calling me good? To which I want to ask, why are you worry, wasting their time with the whole good thing, all right? It's almost as if he's saying, you need to be careful with the words you use to describe people. You need to think carefully about who is good and who is not good. All right? And then what does he do with that whole point? Just totally lets it go. He just, he just wants to throw that in the mix of, hey, be careful using this word. Because when you use this word about me, you'll very easily use it about yourself. And when you start to use it about yourself... You know, go to a funeral. Has anybody ever been to a funeral where they go, this dude was horrible and he's burning in hell right now? But odds are, if you've been to enough funerals, how many of the people that are being buried are burning in hell right then? But nobody's going to say it. Why? Because it's a funeral. It's a eulogy. It's a good word, all right? It's not, boy, this guy was horrible, all right? which is embarrassing to be his friend, all right? Good riddance, all right? Because we use this word good, and we start to put it onto ourselves. You go ask people, are you a good person? Do you think you'll go to heaven? Ninety-something percent of the people will say, yeah. What would Jesus say? No, no, no. Why are you using this word this way? Be careful using this word. So, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, now, that's a good thing, right? Eternal life? This phrase is used 44 times in the Holman translation, all right? It's only used one time in the Old Testament. I want you to look at it so you can understand why this question comes up. Go to Daniel 12. Turn your text to Daniel 12. It's page 1215 in my Bible. I don't know if that helps at all. In Daniel 12... The Holy Spirit speaks to Daniel and says to him this. He says, Daniel, at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands watch over your people, will rise up. All right, now we're talking about the the time of tribulation here. Watch this. There will be a time of distress, trouble, tribulation, affliction. Not sure what word yours is. It's this idea that Jesus is going to talk about later as the time of great tribulation, all right? There will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book of life will what? Escape. So there is a time of tribulation, but then there will be a time of escape, all right? After the escape, we believe that the time of wrath comes in. Verse 2 says this, Many of those who sleep in the dust, translate that, what does that mean? They're dead, okay? Is that easy enough? All right, all right. Who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to what? Eternal life. This is the only time this phrase is used in the Old Testament. The only time. And some, theoretically, will, will awake to what? Shame and eternal, what do you have? Contempt? Everybody have contempt? Anything different? All right? All right? Now, if those are your options, some are going to wake to eternal life, 
and some are going to wake to shame and eternal contempt. Those are your two options. There's no middle ground of, you know, you get to live in the playground until you straighten things out, and then you get to jump one way or the other. No, it's one or the other. So what, it should, what should be the philosophical, theological ambition of your life? You need to find out what? What gets me where? To eternal life. So would that be a relevant question to ask someone who has some theological background or some understanding or some knowledge of the Scriptures? What must I do so that I get to inherit eternal life and theoretically what? Not inherit shame and eternal contempt. You need to ask that question. You desperately need to ask that question for yourself. Otherwise, you're just walking through life being nice to people, thinking you're going to go to heaven someday. You need to ask that question, what is going to put me in the eternal life camp and not in the eternal shame and contempt camp? What is it that's going to affect that? So he's asking a great question, isn't he? And not only that, what's his posture? This ruler, this one with authority, this one with great wealth, all right, has run up, knelt down, and he's asking this Jesus of Nazareth who has demonstrated some sort of authority, power, what must I do? What in your eyes must I do to inherit eternal life? And he refers to him as the teacher. So you, he must have some knowledge, some, some divine knowledge of what might accomplish this. All right? This is the exact same question that's asked when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. All right? Same guy walks up and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, let me tell you a story. This is when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. So what do you have so far? What's this guy? Anybody looking down their nose at this guy yet? This guy who has run up, knelt down, asked, postured himself before Jesus in submission and says, what, what, what is it I need to do? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And that word do is prominent. He's asking, I need to do something. I feel like I need to do something. All right? Um, Matthew asks the question, um, says, if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. To which the guy asks what? Which ones? Why? Because how many were there? The VBS answer is 10. The advanced church training, training union version is 613. So Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, asks what question? Which ones? Which ones? And so Jesus says this, you know the commandments. And look at the commandments he chooses here in Luke. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Which number is that? Ken, help everybody out. You've been teaching the Ten Commandments, right? D commit adultery. You should know this, right? Here's your, your symbol. So, all right. Everybody with Meredith, quit giggling. All right. This is how I learned it when I was a kid, okay? What number is it? Number seven, okay. All right. Do not, what's the next one? Do not murder. All right, you with me? See, y'all are going to learn. It's so simple, all right? Do not steal. See, I stole something. I stole my pinky, all right? I'm telling you, it's just this easy, all right? I'm telling when I was Hudson's age, I learned this stuff, all right? It's still in my brain, all right? What's the next one? Do not bear false witness. Number nine, that's when you leave out the important fact. You commit perjury by lying and leaving out that one fact. What's next? Honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother. See how we learn these things? So easy. Again, we got this, right? They're, the kids know it better than adults in here. All right? They should by now. All right? What does he leave out? He did five, six, seven, eight, nine. How many of them are there? Ten. Why does he leave out the tenth one? What's number ten? Thou shalt not covet. Do you think that's relevant to the conversation here? The rich man who won't give up his stuff because why? He covets. So Jesus leaves that one out. He also leaves out the first four, right? In Mark's version, he throws in this one called do not defraud 
which I think is a combination of 8, 9, and 10. Because I covet something, I'll lie about it, and then I'll steal it away from you. That's defrauding someone, right? In, in Matthew's version, he throws in love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because what's the two great commands to the Jewish people? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. See how it's written to specific audiences here? So what does the, this rich young ruler say? In the, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit perjury. You know, honor your father and mother. What does he say in verse 21? I have kept, is that what word you have? It's the Greek word philoso. Philoso means to guard a prison, all right? In the Philippian jailer, he philoso, all right? He was watching over them. It's to guard it so nothing gets out. What does that tell you about his language? The other word could be tereo, which means to observe it, just kind of look it with your eyes. This is literally to get your hands dirty, okay? He says, what, I've done what with all of these commands all my life? I've seriously managed them, all right? I, I haven't just done the best I could. That's not what he's saying. He says, I've guarded these with all my heart from my youth. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this. Now, what do you think Jesus thought when this man makes this proclamation, I've guarded all these things since my youth? He's religious. Is Jesus thinking, really? Or are you just saying this in front of everyone? What's going on in the conversation? In Matthew's version, it says, I have kept all these young men said, but then he asked the question, what do I still lack? Why is he asking that question? What, what, does, he, what does he realize? Does he realize, yes, I've kept all these, but I don't really feel like I'm qualified for eternal life. There's something more, Jesus. Tell me what it is I need to do more. Or is he saying, what do I still lack? Waiting for Jesus to go, nothing, you're all in, you're awesome. So that everybody can hear. Which is it? We just don't know. We just don't know because he asks, what do I still lack? And in, in Matthew and Mark's version, it's the idea of what am I f falling short of? Literally, it's the same translation from, you know, all of sin and falling short. That's what this is. It's to walk up to the counter and the person says, that'll be a dollar fifty, and you reach in your pocket and you have a dollar ten. You have fallen short. Luke's version is different, though. When Jesus looks at him, he says, You still lack one thing. And it's not the word you have fallen short in one thing, it's more the idea of you have left something on the table. You have forsaken something that you know you should be doing. It's, it's a deliberate thing, not just a, whoop, I don't know, I, don't, I just fell short. No, it's, it's sitting right there, and you've just forsaken it, neglected it, and you know you should be doing it. But here's what I love. In Mark's version, who is told by who? Who's telling the story in Mark? Peter is. It says this, then looking at him, after he says, I've kept all these, then looking at him, Jesus, what? Loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. <coughs> Does Peter know something about the love of Jesus? When Peter is telling this story 30 years later so that Mark could write it down, he sit there and he says, you know what? This guy, this, this, this guy walks up. He was like a ruler, young, rich guy. And we were all kind of watching him. And he started on this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, do you know the commandments? He says, yeah, I know them. I've kept them all. And he said, and Jesus looked at this guy. And we all knew what he was thinking because we had all been through that. We've already been through that humili humiliating moment, right, that we all need to go through where we go, okay, I'm not so righteous after all. And we were all watching, and I watched Jesus' face. And Jesus just loved on this guy. Jesus loved this man. He didn't hold him in contempt. He didn't look down his nose at him. He didn't, wasn't judging him. Jesus loved this guy. And you know how Peter knew that? Because Jesus loved Peter that way. 
And, and Jesus loved Peter enough to call him out and to correct him and to bring him into relationship with him. And so when Peter describes this moment, he knows exactly what Jesus is doing. He says, man, he heard him, he heard him say this, and he just loved on that guy enough to say, you still lack one thing. You're, you, there's one thing missing. Now be careful with this, because it doesn't say, and all of you are lacking this one thing. And here's the universal message for all of you. He says what? You. Second person, singular. You, rich young ruler. You are lacking this one thing. Because see, it could be you are lacking one of those commandments. You are struggling with adultery. You are struggling with anger. You are struggling with stealing, being defrauding, not honoring your father and mother. You are struggling, but this guy, Jesus knew this guy, and Jesus knows you to know exactly what it is you're struggling with, that you are leaving, you're falling short in, that you are forsaking deliberately because you just don't want to go there, and you're withholding this, and why Jesus calls him out, because he loves him, because he knows this one thing is not the end of it, It's the beginning of the separation that this one thing will cause in the life of this person. He says, you lack one thing, and you lack this, and therefore you will not find eternal life. Not because this one thing is going to disqualify you. This one thing is going to drive you away from me. It's going to drive you, and you're going to find confidence in this one thing, and you're not going to turn to me. And he's saying, I'm calling you on it now because I love you. And I want you to find this. And I want you to see this in your life. And what was this one thing? Jesus told him in 22, when he heard this, he told him, you still lack one thing. Sell as much as you have. Right? How much did he have? A lot. He's described as what? Rich, very wealthy, many possessions. The word here is generally implied that he had much land, all right? When they start selling land in Acts, first couple of chapters of Acts, this is the word it's used, all right? He had much property, if you want to go there. Sell as much as you have and distribute to the poor. Now, does that say give all of it away to the poor? It doesn't. That word's not in there. I don't know if it's implied. I don't know what we can do with that. But all it says is sell as much as you have and distribute to the poor. And what? You will have treasure in the heavens. Now that little S that's not there in your verse should tell you this is not some idea. He's not he doesn't have a complete doctrinal picture of everything that's going on. Why? Because he's on this side of the cross. He doesn't understand the full nature of all of this. He has a Jewish mindset which says there are the heavens. And Jesus is saying what you understand to be the next world or the age to come, that's where your treasures will be. So all you're doing is selling what you have now and taking this treasure and placing it over here where it will be safe for you. So go sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Now, again, let's dial it back. What was the one question he asked? What must I do? Jesus says, here's what you must do. Did he really want the answer to this question? Do we? Because Jesus might just be honest with you and say, here's what you must do. And Jesus knows each and every one of us to know that specific, that one thing, the last thing we don't want to give up is the very thing he's going to dare us on. You know why? Because he loves you. He loves you enough to call out the one thing that's going to drive you away from him and plead with you, let go of this. Don't let this get in the way because it may seem like nothing right now, But down the road, it's going to be the very thing that separates you from me. And instead of finding eternal life, what are you going to find? Eternal shame and contempt. 
And he loves you enough to answer the question, what must you do? So there is no cookie cutter of here's what all believers must do. Here's what all Christians must do. No, it's specific enough to you to where you need to think and ask this question. And then when God gives you an answer, what do you need to do then? Obey. The only question is, do you really want that eternal life? Do you really want that? Or do you just want to go to heaven and not go to hell someday? And there's a big difference between those things. Because when Jesus answers the question, what must I do? He says, here's what you must do. What happens? <sighs> you have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. I love this, because what's he doing? He's inviting him to do what? Be a disciple. Be one of my disciples. Come follow me around. Learn from me. Sit with Matthew. Sit with, you know, James and Andrew and Peter and all these guys and just sit here and learn from me. If you've watched The Chosen, it's like, come be a part of our group. And the rich young ruler says what? Nah. Why? Look at it. Look at the text. So, again, what's, what's he supposed to do? You lack one thing. Sell all that you have, as much as you have. Distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. How much value did he place on that? Oh, I get treasure in heaven? All I have to do is sell my earthly trinkets, and then I get eternal treasure in heaven? That's a great deal, isn't it? The guy who finds the pearl of great price. What does he do? He finds the pearl and does what? Goes out and holds on to all of his earthly trinkets and never gets the pearl. What a devastating story. The guy who finds a treasure in a field hides the treasure, which is a little ethical, it's kind of iffy ethically, all right? Sells what? Nothing, because he really likes his stuff. And because he didn't sell any of his stuff, he couldn't go buy the field with all the treasure in it. And he lived miserably ever after with all of his stuff. But that's our story when we ask God, what must I do? What's the thing that's blocking me? What's the thing that's holding me back from this beautiful relationship with you? And he goes, it's this. And you go, ooh. Well, I, I mean, I didn't want to get that serious. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really want that much of you because I like my stuff too. And I like this relationship. And I like this job and I like this, and I like this. I always wanted to, what if you flip the story? And he walked up and said, Jesus, what must I do to become crazy rich? And Jesus says, well, you know how to manage your money, right? You know, you should reconcile your bank statements. You should invest in an IRA. You should do this. You should do this. And he goes, I've done all those things. And Jesus goes, well, you really need to stop following me around. If you'll quit yielding to my lordship and doing everything I asked you, and you just turn away from me completely, then you can be rich. What would they say? What does Peter say in that moment? Where are we supposed to go? I can't turn away from you. But yet here's the story, and it's flipped. Here's the one thing you need to do. The only question is, will he do it? After he heard this, verse 23, after he heard this, he became extremely sad. Mark's version, it uses sort of a, a meteorological term. It's kind of a funny sort of kid skit. Meredith, you'll appreciate this. So uh, imagine the, the little kid who's the overcast cloud. And in this moment, this little kid walks out with his little cloud and puts it over the main character. All right? You like that? All right? And then he just sits over the guy because that's the term here. It's, it's, a, it's a cloud. A cloud comes over this man. And, and how has he been? Runs up, falls on his knees. What must I do to hear eternal life? You know the commands? Yeah, I've kept all those. What's else? What else? What else? Ah, oh, you lack one thing. All right, tell me. What is it? You need to go sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And what happens to the face? <sighs> Little kid rolls out, cloud number one. All right? Puts it over his head. Is that you? You see, this story is not about this man. This story is about you. What is your reaction when God tells you the one thing that's going to interrupt and you don't want to go there? 
the cloud comes out. And he walked away extremely sad, according to, to Luke. This is the word peri lupeo. Peri, we get a word perimeter from this. So perimeter, it means to, to encircle. Peri is to encircle. And lupeo is the strongest word for grief in the New Testament. He is encircled in grief. Some of you have been in that moment before. D it doesn't matter where you turn. You, there's grief all the way around. You can't find a way out. You, you, we might refer to it as the pit of despair. He's a, in the pit of despair, completely encircled in lupeo. And be creating extreme. Why? Why? Because Jesus took away all this stuff? No, because he had a lot of stuff. Imagine this. You walk away from Christ who said, the one thing you're missing is this is going to take you away from me. And you go, oh, but I love this. And the rest of your life, you live miserably ever after, holding on to this. When Christ said, if you'll just set it down and let it go, you will find a joy that you will never, ever be able to replicate with that. But yet, what do we do in our own character? What do we do with our own selfishness? We hold on to it. We blame God because we're miserable. When he said, what must I do? And he says, do this. And he goes, I don't want to do that. I want to keep doing what I'm doing because that's what makes me happy. And Jesus loved him enough to say, no, that's the thing that's going to drive you away. Now, here's my question. Do you blame this guy for not trusting the word of Jesus of Nazareth? I don't. You know why? First of all, because we're on this side of the cross. Who is Jesus? What did he call him? What did he refer to him as? Lord, Messiah, Son of God? What did he refer to him as? Good teacher, didescale. He's just a teacher, and he's from Nazareth, and he's done some interesting little tricks here and there. And so I asked him a question, what must I do? What do you think I should do, Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, you need to go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And in his mind, he's going, oh, I don't want to do that. But that's just the advice of who? A teacher. Remember, we're on this side of the cross. I don't blame him at all. Now, and how long did this conversation take? How long? Two minutes, three minutes? And he walks away. He walks away sad. Is that the end of the story? Did he walk into a bus, <laughs> dead, hell for the rest of his life? No, no it, it's a, it's a three-minute story. Who's to say this guy didn't walk away, encounters the cross, hears the beauty of the message of Christ, and says, he's the one, that's the guy I asked about eternal life, and he told me, go sell everything I have, give to the poor, and I will have treasure in heaven. And he's been raised from the dead. He's not just a good teacher. He's the Messiah. And this guy goes out and sells everything he has and takes the proceeds, the money from all this, and lays it at the feet of the apostles and says, I'm all in. Tell me that could not have happened in this story. Because we get a five-minute conversation. We want to write this guy off as, hey, he's bound for hell. That's it. That was his last chance. That's over. You know what? I just told you the story of Barnabas. I wonder if this is Barnabas. It just as easily could be as it could not. The one who walked away from this teacher guy because he just saw him as the teacher. He didn't see him as the Messiah. And who's the most passionate about telling the story? Peter. When Jesus walks into Peter's life, what does Peter say? Jesus says, hey, let's go out in the deep water. And he says, Master. He doesn't say, Messiah, Son of God. No, he just refers to him by a highly exalted title, Master. 
not even kurios, not even Lord. This is despotes, which means, you know, you're, I know you're, you're bigger than me. You're stronger than me. You're more powerful, authoritative than me. I'll do whatever you say because you you're kind of seem to have some authority. He doesn't refer to him as Lord, but then Jesus takes him out in the deep water and proves who he is with the fish. And what does he do by the end of the day? He left his nets and followed Christ. Why? Because he wasn't just master anymore. Now he is, you are the son of God. To the rich young ruler, he was just good teacher. And this was just advice. Now what happens on the other side of the cross? Now you're Messiah, you're the son of God. I'll do whatever you ask. So I will take all of my property, all of my wealth, and I will gladly sell it and give it to the poor because I want that treasure in heaven. The difference is, who do you think Christ is? How do you treat him? So, Becker, show me that picture. You got it? Y'all know this guy, Usain Bolt? This is your life. You can either see Jesus as the teacher of ethics who tells you to behave, be nice, do this, do this, and do this. And you can keep your head down on this world and on this life, or you can get your eyes up and say, he's the Messiah. I'm not worried about these rules. I just want to worship him. And I'll go to whatever length he says. Because I don't look at the world as a list of check boxes, a list of things I'm supposed to do and not do. Now I'm looking at the one who saved me, and I say, whatever you tell me to do, whatever you desire for me, whatever you say I must do, it's already done. I've already made the decision. You are the Lord of my life. And you see, the difference is all these guys have their head down, and he has his eyes up. So he's going to hear the words of his Messiah, not the words of some ancient teaching. And that will be the difference in your life. When you stop looking at the rule book, thinking I'm good, and you look at the one who saved you, your Messiah, your King, and you say, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be written down in here. You just tell me, and I'm in. That's the difference. And that's when you, when you recognize this, when you stop calling Jesus the teacher and call him the Messiah and your Lord, everything will be on the table. And he will take you to the most beautiful, amazing places. And then one day he will welcome you home to encounter all the treasures you've laid up in heaven. But it's your choice. Let's pray. Father, <coughs> I pray that you would speak so clearly to all of us. I pray that you would, you would make your words so clear to us that you would... Uh, and. and I don't even need to ask this, but I'm, I'm asking because I need to affirm this. I pray that you would love us enough to tell us what we're lacking, to show us the moment, to show us the, the, the trinkets, to show us the relationships that are driving us away from you. Father, I pray that we would stop thinking of you as just some ethical, moral guide in the sky. And that we would see you as this beautiful, atoning, sacrificial God who deeply loves us and desires a relationship, desires reconciliation, desires to welcome us into our eternal home. So, Father, may we ask what it is we need to do. And may we be obedient 